All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. There are three things I want to share with you. Number one, your growth process is complete. Number two, there's nothing going wrong in your life, nor has there ever been. And number three, you're not alone. They are, in fact, what I would call the three biggest secrets that I learned in my conversations mm -hmm. with God. The, the biggest secret of life is that our growth process is complete. In fact, I'll, I'll go further. Growth was never necessary to begin with that you were completely evolved when you came here. That is, at the moment of your birth. You were born in a state of utter perfection. And if you want to see perfection, perfection personified, as I call it, just look into the eyes of a baby. You, you, you will see it there. Nothing is wanted, nothing is needed, nothing is missing. You're looking into the face of perfection. Most people don't understand that they were finished with what they imagined they came here to do before they arrived. That, that the purpose of life was not to somehow get better or, or grow up, you know, oh, grow up spiritually, or to become somehow more than you now are. That the purpose of life is not to become more than you are, but to be who you are and who you were the moment you arrived. Now, the, the problem is, if we think we are here to become somehow more than we were when we arrived, that, we, that, the, that the purpose of life is to evolve into something greater, the, the problem with that is we think that there's something we have to do or to be or to have, that we have to acquire something somehow or another, more wisdom, more understanding, more clarity, and for that matter, that there are physical things we need to acquire as well in order to be the fullest expression of who we really are. But the process works exactly in reverse. In fact, there's nothing for us to be or to do or to have that we are required to be, do, or have in order to express who we really are. The process works precisely in reverse. We are not here to acquire anything but to give everything. We are not here to acquire but to give, to demonstrate. Life is about demonstration. It's not about evolution. So we've not come here to somehow get stuff, even to get more wisdom, more clarity, more understanding, none of that. We are here to give and to demonstrate the clarity, the understanding, the awareness, the consciousness that we came in here with. However, the culture teaches us exactly the opposite. The, the culture into which we were born here on this planet teaches us, you know nothing, you got a lot to learn, you got a long way to go, buddy, blah, blah, blah. And furthermore, interestingly enough, some of the religious culture actually teaches us that what we need to learn, what we need to understand is ultimately ungraspable. That is, it's out of our reach. And that what I understood then in this flash of insight that I received in my conversations with God is that you are perfect just the way you are right now. Or to put it in simple terms, which is difficult for some people to grasp or to embrace, you are divine. That, that is, you are my begotten child. Not just my only begotten son, but you are all my begotten sons and daughters in whom I am well pleased. And your job is not to somehow get better or become more than you are now, but simply to demonstrate who you are right now. And why? Why bother demonstrating who you are right now? What's the purpose of that? So that, I was informed, God might know itself experientially through the expression of life in every one of its forms, including the form that we call you. Now, what, what this meant to me as a practical matter, how you apply that kind of insight into daily life, because people say to me, well, you know, okay, great, but how does that work in nine to five life, is that I discover that when I give what I wanted to receive as if I already have it, then I would experience the havingness of it. Let me, let me be real clear about that. God, God put this to me, Claire, in conversations with God in three simple words, be the source. Be the source became the guiding principle of my life. 
And whenever I find myself wanting anything, gee, I wish I had a little bit more money right now. Gosh, I wish I had a little bit better, smoother going in my relationship. Gosh, I wish my health was a little bit better. Or I wish I had more wisdom, more clarity, more understanding, more uh, awareness. I wish I had more of something or another. Whenever I found myself wishing for more, I would sit down and think, I wonder if there's anybody else around me in my life, friend or stranger, who also wants more of that, who might even imagine themselves to have less of that than I do. I wonder who, how that might work. And I began to decide that I would be the source of what I wished to experience in my own life in the life of another. And so I went out and, and looked for people who, had, who, who, who imagined that they did not have enough money. And I gave them some of the money that I had, even though, as a practical matter, I was experiencing that I did not have enough money. I just decided to say to, say to myself, what if I had enough? What if what I had right now it was enough? And what if it was so much, in fact, that I could actually afford to give some of it away? And I began to give away what I thought I had not enough of. I did the same thing in other areas of my life. I wanted more patience, more understanding, more compassion, more partnership, really. And I found other people who wanted more of the same thing. It's not easy, by the way, to, 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 uh, to, to, I mean, it's not difficult, I should say, I'm trying to say. It's not difficult to find people like that. It's easy to find them. They're all over the place. So I, I simply found uh, people who wanted the same thing I wanted, and I decided to be the source of it, to be the source of compassion, of caring, of understanding, of patience, of forgiveness, and of companionship, and of love. And what I discovered was that when I was a companion to another, and to all others whose lives I touch, suddenly I was companioned, and I was never lonely anymore. When I was the source of patience, and understanding, and compassion in the lives of others, Suddenly, I experienced those same things flowing through me because I discovered that what flows through you sticks to you. And I was able to suddenly Mm. experience my havingness of what I thought I didn't have enough of. And as I began to experience my havingness of it, that experience of havingness, what I call in my cosmology havingness, that experience experience of having that actually acted as a magnet and drew more of it drew more of it to me because I, because my purpose was not to have it all for myself but to give it away now get this get this twist my purpose was not to have it for myself but to give it away and when your purpose is to give it away to others the universe supplies you with an unlimited amount of it because it knows there are a lot of people out there who are suddenly depending on you to be the source of it and that's the secret of every master who has ever walked the earth from Jesus mm. to the Buddha to, to, to Muhammad to any master who has walked the face of the earth they have become masters by giving what it is they chose to experience to others and the universe has supplied them with an ample amount of it that they would never run out because their initial motivation was not to gather it all for themselves but simply to be a flow through that others might have it mm. in abundance that's why some of the masters actually said they said in these words I have come that you might have life in abundance and live it even more abundantly that was their whole purpose their whole raison d'etre and when it becomes yours and mine everything will change there was a guy a guy that came to one of my retreats in Canada a few years ago interesting man he came to me and he said he came on a scholarship because we offer scholarships to our retreats he said Neil I'm here on a full scholarship I couldn't afford to get in if I wanted to he said I, I have hardly a nickel to my name but I'm, I've heard about your books I've read a couple of them maybe you have something to share with me he said because I have nothing right now I have, I have I've got 30 cents in my pocket this is it that's all I have and I said really are you abundant in nothing he said no I have nothing I said you have no humor Oh, he said, oh, I have lots of humor. I, he said, I'm a pretty funny guy when you think about it. I said, great. Do you have any compassion, any understanding, any awareness, any kindness in you that you want to share with others? And I gave him a whole list of things that he said. He acknowledged that he had plenty of. I said, great. Your job in the next four days of this retreat is to share of that which you have in abundance with others because there are others who do not have those things and they don't think they could possibly acquire it anywhere. You go out and be the source of that in the next four days. And by the way, take that 30 cents you have in your pocket and give it away to three people, a dime to three people. I want you to walk out of this building and find three people to whom a dime is a great deal. And don't think, by the way, they don't exist because I was out on the street and what I got was if I got a dime from ten people, I had a dollar and I could get something to eat. 
if it was only a bag of fries. Mm. He said, okay, I get it. A year later, I go back to the same city in Canada. I think it was Toronto. I think we were in Toronto. And we do a retreat, and this guy shows up. I didn't even recognize him. I swear I didn't know who he was. His hair was cut. He was in an incredible tailored suit. He was wearing shoes that must have been Ferragamos from Italy for $340, whatever. It doesn't matter what he spent on his clothes, but he was dressed incredibly well, and, he was, and, and I didn't even know who he was. He sat in the first row, and I said to this guy, wow, you know, I, just as a joke, I really, really, really like that, that uh, cashmere sweater you're wearing. I said, wish I had one like that. <laughs> I was just kind of kidding around, getting the, the room warmed up. And he took the sweater off. He said, I want you to have it. I said, oh, no, no, I was, I was just kidding. I was just fooling around. He said, no, 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 I want you to have this. You, you must have this. We looked to be about the same size. In fact, we were. He said, please take this. It had to be a $700, at least, cashmere sweater. Yeah. And I said, yeah. I said, why would you give me this? He said, because of what you gave me. Don't you remember me? Look at me. I said, who are you? He said, I'm the guy from last year. Who had not, and then suddenly I went, oh, because I've seen so many people since then, you know, but I, my <laughs> mind clicked. I went, oh my golly, what happened to you? He said, I took your advice. <laughs> he got into, he, he, he used his humor and his, and his wit and his charm, because he was a naturally charming guy, and he was a very funny, he was right, he was a very funny guy, and a very naturally humorous guy, and he got a job as a salesman. He began selling real estate, then he began selling cars, because he found out selling cars was easier than selling real estate for him. And no one could say no to this guy. At the end of a year, he was, excuse me for being gross about it, but worth a small fortune. And, wow. and he couldn't stop the, the, the goodness of life from falling in on him because he gave in abundance of what he had. And the universe said, yes, that's what you're doing here. And he got to the same place that I described earlier. He said to me, Neil, I can tell you now, I don't even work for that. I don't even care about it. Here, take this sweater. I want you to have this. I don't, it's not about that anymore. And because it's not about those things, those things are falling in on me almost without effort. And he was a mm. walking, living, breathing example of everything that I was sharing. Take a look at ways in which you have already experienced the completion of your evolutionary process. People, people kind of like, what? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. I say, no, no, really. I want you to, to, to count the ways. Remember the times in your life when you actually expressed yourself at the level of mastery. Has there ever been a time? Or you know what I've discovered is that most people are are, are trained, they're, they're, they're culturalized to deny that. They, 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 oh, wow. they, they get into, oh, shucks, you know, this old thing. Mm -hmm. Kind of like you say to a lady, I love that dress. Oh, shucks, this old thing. <laughs> so, so, right. so we're culturalized to deny it. But when I kind of, I want to say, gently forced, gently required them. No, 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 no. I know there was a moment in your life when you said or did something that only a master would say or do. What was it? They could almost all come up with one or two of those things. They say, aha. So that was a case in which you knew who you really were and you expressed and experienced that. Mm. And we began to, to gather the stories in real time of people who could, in fact, acknowledge and express their mastery. And I said, now, that, you think that was an unusual thing, that, it, that it's something that is not part of your real nature and that you somehow simply rose to the occasion. But I am telling you that you are rising to the occasion all the time. How do you suppose you've gotten through to this moment right now? You're talking to me now and telling me nothing is going right. Things are horrible. I can't take it anymore. Yet here you are still at the front lines. That is mastery. And that is evidence mm -hmm. of mastery. That is evidence of your mastery. And your willingness to even search for the next answer is evidence of your mastery as well. Now let's just take that evidence and turn it around and allow other people to experience the mastery that you have already demonstrated. And you will see the whole of your life shift virtually overnight. The second statement that just erupted is that everything in life is going perfectly and you think that it's not. And so the secret here is to turn frustration into celebration because what you resist persists. Yet what you look at through the eyes of your soul disappears. That is, it ceases to have its illusory form. But we don't understand, most people, and I didn't either before my conversations with God, why are things turning up the way they are? It's all very nice to say that everything is perfect, but it does, sure doesn't feel perfect to me. Unless you know what it is you're trying to do, and unless you deeply understand the process that is required 
in order to do it. In that case, you would see the perfection. And that was the second simple statement that Conversations with God gave me. Statement number one, be the source. Statement number two, see the perfection. These are three word statements that shifted my whole life. Be the source, see the perfection. Well, how, how could I see the perfection <laughs> of living on the street for a year or having no money or having my relationship fall apart and my family ripped away from me and, 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 and my health going downhill? What's perfect about that? Do you mind if I ask? And God would say to me, look, what is happening here is that you are expressing and experiencing the essence of who you really are. And in order to experience the essence, and you're doing that, by the way, God said, as, uh, how can I put this in the vernacular to make it simple, as a favor to me, so to speak. That is, God has created the experience of life itself in physicality as an expression in experience of who and what divinity actually is in its totality. God simply seeks to know itself experientially and is using what you and I call physical life and everything in it, including us, as the means by which to do that. But here's the great secret that Conversations with God told us. In the absence of that which we are not, that which we are is not. That is, it can't be experienced. It can't be expressed. And God gave me a very simple example so that my mind, because my mind couldn't wrap itself around that. You know, when, when God said that to me, I said, oh, come on, help me out. I mean, I'm not really very advanced here in my thinking process. Could you make that simple for me? God said, sure. Supposing that you decided that you are the light. Let's use a really simple, simple example. Just say these words to me, Neil. I am the light. I said, okay, I am the light. God said, great. Now, how would you know you are the light if there weren't darkness? If you were like a candle in the sun, You'd be there all right, along with a million kajillion other candles, but you wouldn't know yourself as the light because you are, in fact, amidst a million kajillion other candles. The, the, the sun wouldn't be the sun without you, by the way. Nay, it would be the sun without one of its candles, and that would not be the sun at all. But how to know yourself as the light amidst the light? And I said, you know, to God, well, you're God. Figure something out. And God said, I did. I already did. I will surround you with darkness. Yet when you are surrounded with darkness, raise not your fist to heaven and curse the darkness not, but use the darkness that you might know who you really are. Be a light unto the darkness that you might express who you really are and that all those who see you would know who you really are and by the light of your example who they really are as well. So I said to God, okay, great, great example. I like, I like the illustration. I mean, I, my mind can hear that. But how does that work in day-to-day, on-the-ground life? H- how do I deal with the so-called darkness that's being foisted upon me, that, 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 that I encounter every day in my life, to say nothing about the world around me? God said, there's a real simple trick here, Neil. It's called gratitude. Gratitude is the attitude. Your job is to be grateful for, that is to be thankful for, Every condition and circumstance of life, no matter how imperfect you imagine that it is, because in fact it is perfectly designed, perfectly created, and has been called forth by you and all those around you in a collaborative effort in a perfect way to present the perfect opportunity for you to perfectly express perfection itself in you, through you, as you. So if you wish to express yourself as kindness, or compassion, or caring, or patience, or understanding, or love, or forgiveness, would you not need conditions and circumstances within which you could become kind, caring, compassion, loving, and forgiving? Would you not need something to forgive in order to experience yourself as forgiving? Well, yes, I would, God, yes, but does it have to be so much? God said it depends on how, how much of a master you want to be. The higher level of mastery you call forth, the higher will be its opposite number in the contextual field. But if you judge it, make it wrong, if you resist it, it will become virtually, in your imagination, insurmountable. Only by embracing and accepting it, 
by actually blessing it, by actually, if you can imagine, being grateful for it, by saying, thank you, God, for this one more chance to announce and declare, to express and to fulfill, to become and to demonstrate who I really am. And that's why, and that's why every great teacher, and one of my favorite teachers is Jesus, so I often use him a lot, that's, but all the great teachers in their own language have all said the same thing. Bless, bless, bless those who persecute you. And be a light unto the darkness. And curse the darkness not. And if a man asks you for your shirt, give him your coat as well. If a man asks you to walk one mile with him, go with him, Twain. And when the world feels like it's call, uh, falling in on you and crashing in on you, at that moment, announce and declare, Ah, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for this one more chance to demonstrate who I really am. And by the way, such a mental attitude is transformational. You can then be in this world, but not of it. Standing amidst the ruins all around you and people will look at you and say what is it you have what is it you know that I don't appear to have or know and then you can say come come here with me let me show you and when enough people understand what you understand embrace what you embrace and demonstrate what you demonstrate all the stuff that causes the world around us to fall apart begins to disappear because it is no longer needed as a contextual field within which we can express and demonstrate who we really are. We begin to push it further and further away from us, even, in fact, ultimately off the entire planet as well. But a lot of people say, you know, I've tried this, Neil. It hasn't worked. How much longer does this not having what I want have to go on? It will go on as long as you say that you do not want what you have. If you want what you have, you will ultimately have what you want. But if you say, I don't want what I have, then you are denying the very gift that makes it possible for you to have what you want. You are literally pushing away from you the circumstances, conditions, and situations that make it perfect for you to demonstrate and experience what it is you wish to have. Even if you had it, you wouldn't even know you had it. You wouldn't even know that, that it's part of your reality because you are pushing away its opposite number. What you resist persists, and what you look at disappears. That is, it ceases to have its illusory form. Therefore, give that which you wish to receive and share that which you think you have not enough of. And you will discover that part two of the process is absolutely true. Your life is perfect just the way it is right now. There's nothing going wrong. Everything has occurred exactly the way it needed to occur in order for you to express and experience who and what you are right here, right now. But as long as you make it wrong and say, Neil, you don't understand. Something terrible happened to me when I was seven. I'll never forget it. And you don't understand. To the degree that you make what's going on wrong, to that degree you'll make it very difficult to experience what life was designed for you to experience, who and what you really are. Let me use the example of the person for, perhaps who's in an abusive relationship. It could be an abusive marriage or an abusive relationship at work where the boss is just being unkind to you and verbally abusive every day or in any other situation. It could be more serious or less serious than that. But a lot of us have been in those kinds of situations and circumstances and regretfully some people are really in a dangerous situation around that where the person they're living with is actually physically abusive and could be endangering their health or if not their very life. So, so, so let's, let's talk about that just for a second. If you were to to apply these principles, of course you would not sit there and say, bring it on, bring it on, abuse me more, I'm just a doormat, walk all over me. No, no, you, of course you would not do that. But what you would do is you would discontinue imagining or thinking of what's occurring as somehow imperfect. You would in fact say to yourself, ah, I see, this is occurring perfectly in my life right now, that I might announce and declare express and fulfill, become and demonstrate who I really am. And part of who I really am is not only a person who forgives others when they have forgotten who they really are, but also one who loves the self. That I choose now to demonstrate my love of self 
And this situation has been perfectly co-created by the lot of us to allow me to demonstrate my love of self. So now I can finally answer the question, what would love do now? Love for myself and indeed love for the other. I know that these behaviors that you're demonstrating are not new to this particular experience of you and I. I get that this is your deepest understanding of the only way to be and to survive in the world. I'm going to love you out of that. I'm, going to, I'm not going to make you wrong for your behaviors because I understand them. I get that the sins of the Father have been visited upon the sons even unto the seventh generation. I get that you are deeply mired in the illusions of life that drive the engine of your experience. I get that. And so I don't even have to forgive you for the abuse that you have placed in this space of our experience. But I will tell you that I will no longer receive and accept that level of abuse from you. I will love myself enough to remove myself from the space of that abuse, and I will love you enough to tell you that you, you're demonstrating yourself in this particular way. It's not the highest and most glorious aspect of who you are. And, and in, in living in that way, when we, when we give ourselves the strength and the courage to remove ourselves from situations such as that, we sometimes, sometimes discover <clears throat> that the worst thing that ever happened to us turns out to be one of the best things that ever happened. I think that the idea that there's nothing going wrong in my life was one of the biggest shifts and changes that could ever have occurred in my consciousness. I began to stop condemning the many things that looked like were going wrong in my life and to use them as tools in the creation and the recreation of who I really am. But you know what else it did? It removed from my consciousness resentment, anger, disappointment, frustration, and righteousness. And when those five elements are removed from one's consciousness, all the poison disappears. We can even look at our so-called enemy, at the one who did it to us, with okay. kindness and love and caring and compassion. And, and the third secret of life is that you are not alone you are not alone in this process that we call life. And the, what I observe in people that I've worked with individually is that they think they are alone, and that's what makes it intolerable. Almost any experience in life can be embraced and tolerated, if you please, if we imagine that we are at least in a shared space with another and that we have someone that we can talk to about it and and get help from and that we're not we're not alone around all of that loneliness is one of the biggest uh, emotional loneliness even and not I mean just physical loneliness because you can be in a relationship and still still be emotionally alone as as people have discovered you can be in a house full of people uh, and be emotionally alone but emotional loneliness is the biggest single problem facing humanity today by the way that's why the the most uh, severe punishment that any um, system and impose upon you in any penal institution is solitary confinement. They're very clear that being alone is the worst thing that uh, people uh, could have happen to them, being forced to be alone. We know at a cellular level that our basic nature is that we are not alone, that is that we are all one and therefore that we are never alone in the sense of everything else is part of us. We, we know that at, the, at a cellular level. That's why the impulse of all of life is to move toward life itself. You can't pass a flower without picking it up and wanting to put your nose into it. When I, when I see lilacs bloom in the spring, I've got to go over there like Ferdinand the Bull and put my nose right in the middle of the lilacs. And I stand there and I smell them. I move, I move toward all of life in that way. The impulse of life is to merge with other life to experience that merging, in fact, is not even necessary. To experience that you are already merged. But when you don't know that, then you have an emergency. That is, you face a critical spiritual uh, problem, a critical spiritual passage in your life when you are not clear of your basic nature. But the basic nature of life is, and the basic impulse is to express our oneness and the fact that we are not alone 
in the sense that everything else is in uh, the same boat with us, that we're all together, if you please, that we are all one. Now, when uh, that's why when we have life experiences that run against that basic nature, we wonder what's going on. We, we said, to why? I don't understand. I don't understand. Well, why is it like this? Why? Wh- and and the, the feeling of aloneness or emotional loneliness is just about the worst feeling we can have because it, it, it bumps up against and contradicts our very nature. Again, that which we know at a cellular level must be true. The antidote to that is twofold. One, to hold as truth that we are never alone. That God, well, first of all, that there is a God that exists. There is, there is in fact, a thing called God. You call it whatever you want, Yahweh, Jehovah, Allah, Brahman, by whatever name and whatever label it suits you to refer to that ineffable essence that is the divine, as I mentioned earlier. So we notice that God exists. God is. And secondly, we notice that there's no place that God is not. That God is not here and not there. You know, up there but not down here. But that God is everywhere. We notice that God is everywhere all the time. And that God will show up in your life in surprising ways and in unlimited numbers of forms. That is, that there's no limit to the forms that divinity will take to demonstrate itself to you if you are unable to demonstrate itself, demonstrate God's self as you in you. And and life will continue to inform life about life through the process of life itself. And God will continue to demonstrate God through the process of being God itself. For instance, wouldn't it be interesting if that what's happening right now, if if the fact that people are listening to this message right now is God's way of saying, you know, could I be more obvious? Could I be more direct with you? Who do you think set this up this way? And what are you doing sitting here listening to this right now? If this isn't divinity demonstrating itself to you vividly, allowing you to know that you are not alone, then what is? So for me, the awareness that divinity is with me, part of me, in me, as me, and surrounds me, all around me, has allowed me to not feel alone. I can go to sleep at night and I have actual conversations. I, mean, I sit down and say, hey, God, you know, nice to have a quiet time with you. Glad you're here again. And God says to me, by the way, a, a wonderful statement in conversations with God. You might recall this statement, I have sent you nothing but angels. This gets back to point number two, when we want to make the other person the villain in our story. But not only the villain, but the heroes as well in our story are all aspects of divinity demonstrating itself to us. I have sent you nothing but angels has been an extraordinary insight and awareness that I have brought into my life. But the biggest insight and awareness is that God itself, in its highest and grandest form, is always with me and never apart from me, and that I can uh, talk to and communicate and access and become aware of and receive assistance from that aspect of the overall ultimate reality at any time that I wish. Now here's what happens. If we are conscious of the fact that God is always with us, God's revealing of itself to us will become more obvious to us. That, That is, you'll start seeing God's messages everywhere. Honestly, you'll, you'll be driving down the road, it'll be on the billboard, on the, on, the, on the sign on the highway, or the chance utterance of a friend on the street, or the lyrics of the next song you hear on the radio, and you'll slap your forehead with the palm of your hand and go, oh my goodness, there it is again. The fastest way to experience that you are not alone in your life and that God is present always in your life is to be the source of that experience in the life of another. Someone else is looking for God. Someone else is looking for companionship, for help, for understanding. In their life right now, indeed, someone else is begging for it. But so long as you imagine your life is all about you, you've got to solve your problems first before you can solve it anywhere else, you will have missed the fundamental essence of this message and the primary purpose of life itself. However, if you decide that your job in the next 24 hours, to say nothing of the next 24 years, is to be the source of God's presence in the life of another. 
you will experience God, God's presence in your own life immediately and automatically. It cannot be any other way. You, you begin to deal with the challenging moments of your own life in an entirely different way. And you begin to find an inner serenity that you really, really did not know was possible. You can find that in meditation, in prayer, in other certain kinds of spiritual practices, and those are wonderful practices, but we're talking now about experiencing, or about having those kinds of experiences in the everyday moments of your life. That all of life, in fact, turns out to be a meditation. All of life turns out to be a prayer. And we begin to experience that when we embrace the ever-present notion of God's eternal guidance, wisdom, understanding, clarity, and oneness, that God's eternal oneness with us. But you know, the, the, the true reward comes in flipping the, the axis of our life. If, if God said something of prime importance to me uh, in conversations with God, and she did, it was this. It was when she said to me, Neil, your life has nothing to do with you. I get that you think that it does, but in fact it doesn't. You're done. You're complete. Everything is over, finished. You don't have to evolve. You don't have to grow. Neil, your life has nothing to do with you. It has to do with everyone whose life you touch. And that doesn't mean be self-effacing and self-sacrificing and do nothing for yourself. Quite to the contrary. Everything you do, you will do for yourself because there's no one else to do it for. However, it means that how you act on your own behalf will be demonstrated in such a way that everyone whose life you touch will be given back to themselves. They will see by the light of your example who they really are. Therefore, in fact, step into the world knowing that not only is God with you always, but that God is with everyone else as well through you. Dare you to say it. Dare you, dare you, double dare you. God has arrived in your life this minute because I am here. All God does is remind itself of itself by being itself. Did you hear that? I said all that God does wow. is remind itself of itself by being itself. So you go around and remind all the other aspects of divinity of who they really are by demonstrating who you really are. Let your life so shine before men that they will see who you really are and see themselves in the light of your example. Or as someone put it once before, vividly, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Hmm. That's why Beautiful. I am here. Hmm. And so it turns out, Claire, after all, that life is not about get the guy, get the girl, get the car, get the job, get the house, get the office in the corner, get the kids, get the grandkids, get the promotion, get the bigger house, get the bigger car, get the gray hair, get the retirement watch, get the sickness, and get the hell out. There's more going on in the process of life. In fact, all that I've just said has nothing to do with it. And yet all those wonderful things can be experienced by us, through us, as us. The things we want in our life, relationship, right livelihood, an experience of full expression, creativity, dynamism, wonderfulness, joy, family, all the things we yearn for will come to us without effort when we apply these three secrets. 